All right, let's take our Bibles this morning, find our way to Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61 should be an extremely familiar portion of Scripture for you. And if it's not, you might want to memorize some of this great and wonderful and beautiful text. We are right in the middle of our Advent series. Uh, For those of you that maybe that word is a little bit foreign to you, uh, the word Advent simply means coming or presence. And so we are thinking about the first Advent now of our Lord Jesus Christ, His birth into the world uh, through the Virgin Mary. And uh, we are thinking about the incarnation, the virgin birth, getting ready, ready to celebrate Christmas. And so the church traditionally over history has taken the four Sundays prior to Christmas Day to speak about and remind the church at large about the Advent season. And so we think about on the first Sunday of Advent, hope. And it is funny that uh, they want to draw our attention to the first Advent by reminding us of the second Advent. So that we remember the baby in the manger, we are reminded of the line that will come again one day to rule the nations. And then we spoke uh, about peace. And uh, this Sunday, of course, and you can see on the Advent wreath, the third candle, the uh, pink candle here that is lit, is the uh, subject of joy. And we think about this Christmas season having uh, lots of joy at this time and uh, whatever that looks like in your family, in your life, with your friends and the way that you live, we think about joy, especially in the context of the coming of the Son of God into the world. So this week, uh, uh, Billy and Jamie and myself, we were out of town a couple of days doing some planning for next year, 2015. Very excited about all that the Lord's going to do for us. And uh, on the way back, I was uh, studying my notes for this Isaiah passage and thinking about uh, joy and how we might be able to work that through this and seeing these first three verses and just had joy on my mind. And uh, Billy was driving and he looked over. He said, well, what's the subject? I said, well, the subject's on joy. And he said, well, you know, that's interesting. He said, for the last few months, one of our youth... Every time there's been a question in youth group or every time there's been a question in Sunday school, uh, this particular youth just answers joy. Joy. That's the answer for everything. Joy. Jesus, others, and you. Right? Using the acrostic for joy as Jesus, others, and you. And I said, well, I've never heard that before. Jamie, have you ever heard that before? No, I never heard that before. And then uh, we drove a little bit longer, started reading the text a little more. I thought, well, Jesus is in there. Read the text a little bit more. Well, others are in there. Read the text a little bit more. Well, you're in there. And so I decided today to use that acrostic as just a three-point easy sermon for us today to remember joy, Jesus, others, and you. Read with me, if you will, silently as I read the Word of the Lord out loud for us these First three wonderful, wonderful verses of the book of Isaiah. 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of joy or gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. May God add His blessing to the reading and the preaching of His holy and inspired and inerrant Word of God. Bow with me for a word of prayer as we begin. Our Father, Your Son, in Luke chapter 4, walked into the synagogue and took the Isaiah scroll and opened to Isaiah 61. And he began to read 
and proclaim your word. And I pray today, Lord, as I stand to open your word to the same portion of Scripture, that you would open all of our hearts today, that you would help all of the people under the sound of my voice to do the very best they can to lean forward and listen and sit on the edge of their seat, not at me, but at your word, not at the words I say, Father, but the word of the living God and the spirit of Christ and Christ himself. Lord, no doubt in a room this size of people, there are those who are hurting and despondent and depressed. There are those who are nervous and anxious about the coming days and life and family and confrontations and all that is in our life. We need the joy of God. We need you to break into our lives and give us something this morning that cannot be found at the bottom of a bottle, Lord. We need something that cannot be found underneath of a Christmas tree. We need something that cannot be found in a bank account. We need the joy of an everlasting Father through the Son by way of the Spirit. We need your power and joy today. And so collectively, as your body, we call to you We plead from You to give us joy. And we will not stop thanking You. We bless You and praise You. In the name of Christ we pray these things. Amen. Joy. So what is joy? I think in a moment I'm going to tell you how just three simple points of how we might uh, get joy into our life and we'll just remember it as Jesus, others, and you. But I think first of all we want to say that joy is a transcendent contentment regardless of circumstances. Let me say that again. Joy is a transcendent contentment regardless of of circumstances. You say, what does that mean? It's simply that it is transcendent, that joy is not something that you can uh, attain on your your own. Joy is not something that comes to you because you own things. Joy is not something that comes to you because you want a prize or where you live or your lot in life. Joy must come outside of ourselves. In fact, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. You must have joy to live in the Christian life the way that God intended it to happen and it must be transcended. It must come from outside of ourselves. There are many people and you've met them in church life that fake joy. You ever met those kind of people? smile all the time. There's never a bad day in their life. Nothing ever goes wrong. And uh, they just want you to believe that till they get in their car and go home and their life is crumbling and falling apart. No, not everybody's like that. You can't manufacture it. You can't fake it. If you want joy, it has to be transcended. It must come from God. And ultimately, joy is the contentment in the fact that God is the supreme ruler of all the world and that God is in control of all the circumstances of your life. Ultimately, joy comes in our lives when we trust that God is in control. I'm not exactly sure where your circumstance finds you today. Maybe you're in a position where you're hurting or maybe you are on the mountaintop or whatever it is that's going on in your life. What I can tell you is you can have the true transcendent contentment of God given to you in your heart where regardless of your circumstances, regardless of where you are, you can have the joy and the happiness and the power and the presence of God. Why? Because you trust Him above all other things in your life. Years ago, many of you know my sister-in-law had breast cancer and we were sitting in a church auditorium and it was a testimony service on a Sunday night and she had just recently been diagnosed with this cancer. And this fella, as they say in the South, bless his heart. Now I'm going to say something bad about him, right? Right? This fellow, bless his heart, he gets up in a testimony service and he says, I've never had a bad day in my life, hallelujah. Well, just guess what? She's had a bad day in her life. 
And he went on to testify that if you really knew God, you'd never have a bad day. Well, I'm here to tell you, that's a lie. Believers and unbelievers alike have good days and bad days. My sister-in-law walked out of there with tears that night, but she walked out of there with joy because she had something that nobody could take from her. A contentment and a trust and a confidence that God is in control. And when you have that in your heart, no matter what's going on, you can trust Him and He'll take care of you. So let's talk from this passage today. Verse 1 is point 1, verse 2 is point 2, verse 3 is point 3. Very simple sermon. Let's talk about how we can have a transcendent contentment in God where we just are content in the fact that He is in control of all things in our life. Here's the first point I want to make today from verse number 1. Simply, Jesus. Simply Jesus. Look at what it says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Take your Bible and turn over to Luke chapter number 4. You'll want to remain in Luke 4. Keep that handy. The New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Luke chapter number 4. Look what it says in verse 16 and following. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. You see, he came to his hometown, that is Jesus. And it was as, as it was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And look at what He does. And He closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and He sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on Jesus. And He began to say to them, Today... That is, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It is as if Jesus is reading Isaiah 61 verse 1, and He reads it, and He sits down, and He says, that is me, and that is this day. When you're reading Isaiah, certainly there must have been some sort of fulfillment for the Jews that were in captivity during their days. But I promise you that is not the totality of the fulfillment. No, Jesus picks up the scroll of Isaiah and He says, listen, even though this was written 500 years before I was born into the world, this very Scripture is fulfilled on this day. And I tell you today that if you want to have joy in your life, everything must be begin with having Jesus right in your life. Jesus says, that is me and this is the day. Look back in Isaiah 61, verse number 1. Notice here, not only does Jesus say, I am the one that is speaking. I am the one that everything is about. I am the one that is the center of attention here. But all of this takes place within the doctrine of the Trinity of God. Look back, it says, the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Do you see the Trinity there? The Spirit of God, the Father Himself, and Jesus saying, this is is me. Why is it important to understand salvation in Jesus in the context of the Trinity? I submit to you today that when somebody gets born again, they do not necessarily need to know every component about the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mainly when somebody gets saved, they are trusting the cross work of Jesus upon the cross where He dies for my sins and He redeems me and trades my sin for His righteousness. And we walk out saying, glory to God, I have been forgiven. I have the grace of God in my soul. But I want all of us today that are believers to understand this, that there is way more to the gospel than simple forgiveness on the cross. You never grow beyond the gospel. You simply grow deeper into the gospel. 
And the gospel is wrapped up in the work of the Trinity of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is the massive big picture that makes possible the small caption of the cross. It is like a mosaic. Have you ever seen a mosaic made up of a thousand little pieces? and They're all fitting together. Maybe you narrow in upon the one little piece of the mosaic that you say that's beautiful, that is excellent, that is polished, and it fits just in the right place. That's the way the cross work of Christ is. That's the way your salvation is. But once you back up and you say, wait a second, it is not just the cross but all of these small little pieces that brought me to salvation, they are being worked out by an enormous and a wonderful and a glorious triune God where the Father in heaven decrees by His sovereign power to save those that believe upon Him. And He looks all through heaven as Hebrews 2 says, and who is fitting to make possible the work of the cross? His Son, Jesus Christ, comes into this world, born of a virgin, the incarnate Son of God who goes to the cross and dies for our sins and is raised again. And then the third person of the Godhead, the Spirit of God, is alive and well and He is in this room today. And there are people this morning here that are lost and your life is in shambles. You think that you're saved, but you're not saved. And the Spirit of God is knocking upon your heart day in and day out. Every time you hear the Gospel, the Spirit is whispering Spring into your air, believe upon Jesus, and all of the Trinity is at work in your salvation. This isn't even a part of the sermon. This is just a little extra here. It won't even cost you an extra nickel for this application. You know what? Shame on all of us believers who live in a small Christendom. You know what I mean by that? All of us sometimes have no conception of how large and how grand the work of God is in your life. You matter to God. Look, I, I, I'm not up here giving you uh, some kind of Tony Robbins uh, you know, self-esteem speech. But I am going to tell you this. Stop living tiny lives. Start walking in the power of God. Start thinking and living and breathing and meditating and soaking in that your life is more than your work. Do you understand that? Your life is more than your work. Your life is about God. And God has commissioned you. He came to you in the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They came to you to save you. That you might live a wonderful and a glorious and a powerful life for Him. That you might raise up your families and your friends and your church to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have been adopted and pulled into something so much larger than your own life. Live that way. Stop living tiny lives. Live in the power of the gospel. You want the joy of God? You must realize that it begins with Jesus. True joy begins and ends with Jesus. I was thinking it's, it's like Jesus... I, I use sports analogies. Those of you that don't like sports, well, just forgive me, all right? Jesus walks into the huddle. He's the guy that walks into the huddle. He's the all-star. And He says, I got it, guys. That's the Jesus that we serve. That's where joy comes from. You were never meant, like I said last week, you were never meant to bear the burdens of your life. You were meant to be in the yoke with Jesus and say, every day, Jesus, you're in control. I give it to you. Put the game on your back, Jesus, and go in the game for all of us, Jesus. You're more cheerleaders for Jesus in your life. When I was in high school, I know y'all wouldn't think of this now. When I was in high school, I played basketball. And uh, yeah, no, I can hear the laughs. All right. Don't forget, buddy, I still got a couple more points to make. Amen. Uh, <laughs> 
Listen, I, 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 play, I play ball, and I, I, was not, I was not the... Scott Farrington was the uh, superstar on our team, not me. I was the Charles Oakley kind of... Any of y'all remember the New York Knicks? I was a, I was a trash bucket guy. I played down under, played kind of dirty, scrapped, got some rebounds, took charges. That, that was me. I remember one time we were playing a game, and uh, I came down, and I mean, it was the luck of Jesus... I scored three buckets in a row, six points. I was, that was a lot for me, all right? I scored three buckets in a row. And some of my idiot buddies on the bench, I come down the next time down the court, and somebody passed me the ball, and uh, my buddies start yelling, shoot a three, shoot a three, Steve, shoot a three. Man, I never made a three in my life. But you know I had been coming down the court, and I had scored three buckets in a row. And you know what I did? I launched that three, baby. And I know all of you want me to tell you that it went in, right? Air ball. Flat air ball. Chad Hayhurst was the coach of our team. He yanked me out of the, he, he yanked me out of the game. I didn't go back for another quarter. Sit down, Steve. Do you know Why? Because I wasn't the hero of the team. I had a role to play. I had a job to do. Get rebounds, take charges, and shoot if you're one foot away from the basket. That was me. But can I tell you something? Every team needs that. In your life, so many times, you're trying to be the all-star athlete, and I'm telling you something. The longer you live that way in your life, the less joy you'll have. But if you'll begin every day of your life with committing yourself to God and saying, Lord, I am not the hero of my life. You're the one that can make this happen. You're the one that can help me with my family. You're the one that can help me with my job. You're the one that can help me with my church. You're the one that can make all of these things happen. And I'm just simply going to do my part to read my Bible and pray and tell people about Jesus. I'm going to be that role player in the great game of the gospel. There's no end to the joy. You know the games you know the games I loved? You know where the joy was great? When I passed it off to Scott and we won the game. You know the games where I felt terrible? When I got selfish with the ball and tried to be my own hero and lost the game for us. You want joy in your life? Put Jesus first. My favorite author, Dallas Willard, puts it this way, and I'll just move to the next point. Spiritual formation is reorienting your entire life around Jesus Christ. Every day of your life, everything of your life, reoriented around Jesus Christ. He must be the beginning and the middle and the end of everything. And that's where joy comes from. Let me make a second point from verse number 2. Joy comes from Jesus. Joy comes from others. Now, uh, I want you to stay there in Luke as well, too. Let me show you this. So, uh, he says here, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. And then look at verse number 2. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Take your Bible. Go back over to Luke. Give me a second to find it. Luke chapter 4, right where we were. Okay. So, um, verse number 22, picking up. And all of the people were speaking well of him. Isn't that great? All the people were speaking well of Jesus. Jesus was an outstanding preacher to them. They loved Jesus. They were on the Jesus bandwagon until they figured something out. All were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. You know when they say that? When they crucify him. That's what Jesus says to this group. Heal yourself. Whatever we have heard we uh, done in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his own hometown. Why is Jesus saying these things to them? He has just read Isaiah 61. He has just told them that the gospel has come, that it's a great day in the world. And they are loving him and saying, rah, rah, Jesus. And Jesus looks that great group in the face and says, guess what? You are going to crucify me. Now look. 
Verse 25, But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the day of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and when a great famine came on all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, that is, none of the Jews, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who is a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, that is, none of the Israeli lepers, but only Naaman the Syrian. Verse 28, And all, that is all of the people in the synagogue, were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which the city had been built in order to throw him down off the cliff. Five verses ago, they thought Jesus was the greatest preacher in all the world. Five verses later, they want to throw Jesus off the cliff. Why is it? Because Jesus picks up Isaiah 61 in verse number 2 and He says, guess what boys and girls, this is not a racist issue. The Jews are not the greatest in the world. But whoever believes upon Jesus Christ shall have salvation. You are not a privileged people. The gospel goes to all. And then he gives a story where two times the Israelites who should have received the leper of Israel should have been healed. The famine should have been taken away for Israel. But you know what he said? No, guess what? All of the Gentile people, those are the ones who receive the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. You want joy in your life? Stop living in an us for and no more kind of atmosphere. Put other people first in your life. Let me give you two quick points and I'll quit on that. Listen, folks, you guys are getting it. Can I just tell you, you're getting it. I'm so, I love this church. I love you so much. You're getting it. People are going out every week and I'm getting calls and texts and people are talking to me. Pastor, man, I invited somebody to come to church. I invited somebody to come to church and hear the gospel. Man, I wish they'd come. I'm a little down, a little frustrated. I invited them. They wait here. You guys wait on Sundays for your friends and neighbors and people to come. Keep going. Keep doing. Keep giving. Why? Because the great joy of all the world is when you see other people come to faith in Jesus and their lives are turned upside down for Christ and they're made right and made whole and made good. The gospel is good news, not just for the people in this room, but all of the people in the city of Raleigh. Amen? Other people. Give the gospel. You don't have to wait for one of our programs here. Listen, we've got programs. We're going to do things this upcoming year. We're going to provide opportunities for you to, to, uh, to, to share the gospel and to invite folks to church and to feed the homeless and do all these kinds of things. But I want to tell you something. Just take the gospel as a believer right where you are, out into the world. Go be part of a race. Uh, if you like that running stuff, I don't run anymore because I've got a car. But listen, if you like doing that, do that. Just go get in a 5K. And you know what? As you're jogging down the way, share Jesus with somebody by you. And if they run faster, run a little faster. You know what I'm saying? Invite somebody to church. Listen, do just go, go do something. If you want to, if you want to go, uh, if you want to go to a, a rescue mission and, and help serve in a food line, listen. You don't have to wait for us. We're going to provide some opportunities for you. We're going to provide some training for you. But for heaven's sakes, just go down there and do something in your community to love on people and share the gospel. And invite folks to come here. Let me just give you one other. I guess I'll give you this point. Uh, joy grows out of a heart of sacrifice. Let me ask you, I was thinking of this question this week, and what did you do this past week for someone that demonstrated love and led them to the gospel? I wasn't sure whether I was going to call names or not, but it, it'll be a... It'll be, it'll, Take me a whole long time to like not call names. So let me just tell you one way that I think somebody, it was just brought to my attention, one way that I think, and I better put a caveat here. You all are doing a great job. Just because I use one example doesn't mean you're not doing a great job. Just came to my mind. I thought it was pretty sweet. I looked on uh, Facebook after Friday where Ashley had uh, said something about Charlie 
and maybe somebody else helping at the women's Christmas dinner uh, to serve drinks. That didn't take that long. It was a great opportunity for somebody in our church to minister to somebody else in our church and to demonstrate love toward them and to lead them more toward the gospel so that each of them are learning how to see Jesus on the cross of His love and His grace and His kindness. Now listen, that happens all the time. Ladies, I'm sorry to call attention to you. I just want our church to see that that's happening. But I want to ask you something. In your life, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your co-workers, with everything that's going on in your life, what did you do for somebody this last week that demonstrated love and led them to the gospel? Where does joy come from? Joy comes from Jesus. Joy comes from others. Joy comes from you. Look back down at the text. I'll finish with this. Look at the, uh, I don't have time to exegete all of this today, but look at the end of verse 3 of Isaiah 61. To grant those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting. Do you see the contrast here? The compare and contrast? You need to highlight that. He's saying this is what the gospel does. It gives good to where the bad was. Isn't that what the Bible says in the New Testament about Jesus? That he took our sin into himself that we might become the righteousness of God. And then I want you to see this beautiful phrase. Look at the end of verse 3. So that, here's the reason why God does all of that through Jesus. So that they will be called O of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that He may be glorified. I wish I had time to, I wish I had time to go all the way through the book of Isaiah and show you His agricultural use of this. You're going to find that, um, you're going to find that uh, Jesus is called in Isaiah the branch. You're going to find at the end of Isaiah chapter number 6 that all of the land is desolate, but up from the ground comes the shoot of Jesse that one day will blossom. And it is out of him that comes believers resting and nesting within the great tree of God through faith so that they will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why does all of that happen? That He may be glorified. Joy finds its culmination in a life lived to God's glory. Great statement of faith. What is the chief end of your life? Is it to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever? Maybe on a bad note, I just want to say here something. Uh, just... Say, I'm not sure, did y'all hear about this last week? The uh, forestry um, came to do some testing on the oak tree out here in the yard. Uh, that oak tree, I think uh, Mike Mason has told me, is over a couple of hundred years old. And a great oak tree, the forester did some uh, testing on it. And um, although it appears healthy now, the truth of the matter is that the tree is rotting from the inside out. I'm sorry to tell you, but by this coming June, the tree will not be here. And um, that's not true. That's not true at all. Forster didn't come this week. You all, you all just made my final point for me, and here's what I want to say to you. After we've all had a little laugh, I want to ask some of you this. God says, so that you might be the righteous oaks planted deeply in God for His glory. When I said that this tree was rotting from the inside, there was a collective sigh out of everybody because we love it. Some of you are trees spiritually that are rotting on the inside. You're not walking with God. You're not planted deeply. And you are not what you should be. I wonder if you have that same kind of sigh and despair over your sin and over your walk with God. You know where joy comes from? Joy comes from making Jesus the beginning and the end of your life. Joy comes from placing others as important in your life, sacrificing and putting them so that you're giving the gospel and loving on people. 
Joy comes when you pay attention to yourself and you take that internet pornography that's rotting your tree and you crucify it and get right with God. Where you take that horrible, debilitating, gossipy attitude and frustration and anger that you have toward each other and you crucify it and make Christ the King. You want joy? Become a righteous oak through the work of Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The musicians are coming. Just in a moment we'll stand and sing a hymn of response. Hey, here's, here's what it is today, folks. Isn't it just a simple sermon? No, no, nobody looking around, heads bowed, eyes closed. Hey, why don't you just do your neighbor a favor? Just, just take a moment to close your eyes. Joy. Jesus, others, you. wonder which part of that you need to make right with God today. In a moment we'll stand and sing. And these uh, altar right up here where these steps are, we open it up. In the weeks previous to this, you've seen some people come down and pray. They just want to spend a moment with God making things right. Other people who do not know Jesus as their Savior, we want to come and see somebody. We'd love to take you in a back room and, and talk with you a little bit about further about the gospel. Do business with God today. We're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. What a wonderful time. Joy comes from Jesus, others, and you. Won't you stand with us and sing today?